Hello, and welcome to this week's Worship and Meditation Service. Since I was asked to introduce this week's service, I have been trying to get my thoughts in some sort of order. I wish we didn't need to do service this way, and we could go back to the future, to 2019. But as we know, for the time being, this is how we do church. I keep wondering what and where God is in this. Then I was reading Ecclesiastes 3 and things became a little clearer. There is a right time for everything. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to destroy, a time to rebuild, a time to cry, a time to laugh. A time to dance, a time for scattering stones, a time for gathering stones, a time to hug, a time to find, a time to lose, a time for keeping, a time for throwing away, a time to tear, a time to repair, a time to be quiet, and a time to speak up, a time for loving, a time for hating, a time for war. A time for peace. This was written by Solomon in the 10th century BC. God has a plan for our lives. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. You will find me when you seek me in earnest. We are in the right place at the right time. God is walking through this with us, holding our hand. He will change our thinking towards the ecology, our consumerism, our relationship with each other, and our thankfulness for all the simple blessings we often take for granted. Keep praying, keep thanking, keep well, keep the faith, Keep joyful. We have an amazing God. Now please join us as we sing, My God. Thank you. Oh
crushed and bleeding, yet crying, Father God, forgive my God, became broken to make me Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever this meditation finds you, I pray that you be known the joy of the Lord as your strength and enjoying the beautiful weather we've had over the past couple of days. I just wanted to take this slight change in our normal schedule to update you on what's happening at Coastline in the next couple of weeks as we move ahead into the different phases of lockdown. And before I do that, just let me pause here. And I know you've heard me say this many times, but it comes from somebody who is genuinely blessed to see it. Thank you for your love, your support and your care to each other and to the fellowship and to the food bank and to the local community at this time. It's been tremendous to see. And I do pray, keep it up. We're going to need it not only in the next couple of months as we go through the corona thing, but as we come out the other side, we're going to need that sense of fellowship, love and support and prayer. Prayer is essential to all that we do. And thank you for your prayers, for the fellowship. And for me personally, they are needed for wisdom as we help to seek and love those around us. And I know that Dave, myself and the deacons are really thankful for everything that you have done at this time. So thank you and bless you. Where we're at at the minute is we're into phase one now of the lockdown. I'm sure you've heard the First Minister give her speech on Thursday. And that basically means no change for us at the minute. Phase one is still church buildings are still closed. There's no internal meetings and we'll still keep on giving out the newsletters, the meditations, doing shopping, doing cups of teas and chats over garden walls and seeing folk and being here in support as best as we can. So nothing will change in phase one and that's to last for the next couple of weeks. And then if all goes well, we move into phase two on June the 18th. And again, this isn't going to be much of a change for the church. Phase two means we can open the building after strict cleansing and hygiene practices for private prayer. So we'll probably have some sort of drop-in service at Coastline and I'll base myself more at Coastline as that happens. But that's all. We'll still be doing the meditations, the prayers. We might move on to other things in terms of how we present stuff on the internet but not much will change and unfortunately the building will still be strictly closed apart from private prayer. Beyond that in mid-July we hope to see things easing a bit more and we'll be in touch with more details about how that will look be it outdoor services or different things as we go into mid-July. So not much has really changed in terms of our lockdown operations but we're still here We're still serving you and the community. And if you do need anything, do get in touch with us through the numbers that are on the website or the email addresses on the website. We miss seeing each one of you. And I know this has been a difficult 10 weeks. It's hard to believe it's been 10 weeks. And it is hard. We're not designed to be apart from each other for that length of time. This is unprecedented in any stretch of history. But the Lord is good. And he is doing things in this that we never thought possible. The outreach with the meditations and the chance to see folk in the streets and the conversations that have been had across the board by many folk in our fellowship really has been the Lord's doing. And he has been at work. So keep praying, keep loving, keep hoping, keep sowing, and we will see 
just how good he has been in the midst of what has been trying and tragic circumstances for many in our nation. So if you have any further questions, do get in touch. But let me pause now just and pray for us as we go ahead. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We acknowledge first and foremost, and rightly so, the pain that many have experienced in these days. For those who are worried about their jobs, for those who more importantly have lost loved ones or are worried about loved ones and health situations, we ourselves sometimes feel unequal to the task. And we thank you for those moments because those moments cause us to lift our eyes above the hills to see where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And we thank you that you will not let our foot slip nor move. So we commit all these circumstances to you. For those in our fellowship who are experiencing that pain, Lord, we commit them to your good shepherding care. For those who have had the blessing of seeing you move in these days in unexpected ways, we give you thanks for your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to us, O Lord, our Father. So we thank you that in all stages of life you are with us. And as we now go into the future, Lord, we don't know what the future brings. You tell us to live each day as it comes, and so we pray for grace each day as we move ahead. We thank you that your grace isn't given stingily, but richly and lavishly. So bless us today and give us grace for tomorrow. And help us too, Lord, in our plans to be wise and to follow your Spirit's guidance so that we too can hasten the day when we meet together again as your people to worship you, not over the internet, but with one voice and one heart in one location. We leave these things with you, Lord, for you are our good Father who loves us and looks after us through Jesus our Lord. Amen. reading comes from Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 13 but when we come to the meditation shortly do keep your Bibles open at Acts chapter 2 as we'll look at other parts of it as well. 
Acts chapter 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested in each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language to the disciples. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these here speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Almanites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. And visitors from Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretans, Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? Buller's mock said they are filled with new wine.
Family can be a funny old thing, can't it? And I'm sure everyone says amen to that. And I don't know about you, but in your family, I'm sure you've got a an auntie or an uncle who, well, they're unique. They kind of keep themselves to themselves. And they're family, like we recognise them at family events. There's a, There's a sense of familiarity and connection, but we don't quite know what to do with them. Keep that thought in mind as we now turn to what this Sunday is. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Last week we looked at the ascension of our Lord Jesus into heaven and now on this Sunday we mark the outpouring of the third person of the Godhead upon the church, the Holy Spirit of the living God. It's a day that's good to remember as it's sometimes called the birth of the church or the recommissioning of the people of God from being the people of Israel to the people of many tribes, tongues and nations united by the Holy Spirit being given out. And the reading I read to you there from Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 13, we see the Holy Spirit come upon the apostles and disciples in the upper room in a very powerful way. And the imagery there is significant too. Is firstly the wind uh, in Hebrew, the word for wind and spirit is very close. That's why Jesus would pick up in John 3 and say that the Spirit of God is like the wind that blows where he chooses. And it's that idea of a powerful, life-giving force. Again, think of Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones where Ezekiel preaches to the dry bones and the wind comes upon them and they come alive. The Holy Spirit is this idea of a life-giving power. And the other image there is a fire. Flames of tongue appear to rest on each one of them. And we know from Scripture that fire symbolizes holiness, purity, difference. Hebrews says our God is a consuming fire, this untamable, powerful, awe-inspiring force. So this two images of fire and life-giving symbolizes the Holy Spirit, who isn't a force, but he's the living person, the third member of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the reason I talked about unfamiliar aunties or uncles at the start is because a lot of people in Christian circles don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. They're, they're maybe scared by the excesses and unbiblical practices of some who frankly bring disgrace upon the name of the Holy Spirit, or they swing to the other extreme and don't talk about him altogether, but sort of keep him out of the way, and that, that's not right either. The Holy Spirit is involved in the church for three powerful reasons. Firstly, he comes to help us talk and show Jesus to the world. Some of the meditations we've looked at over the past couple of weeks have focused on Jesus in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. How does that happen? It happens through the Holy Spirit linking us into the life of the Trinity. Isn't that amazing? And when he comes and dwells in us, one of the primary things he does is help us talk about Jesus, to show Jesus. As Paul would say, we become the fragrance of Christ to those around us. The light shines out of us, treasure in jars of clay. And that's what Peter does there. If you look at verses 22 and following, after Peter talks about in verses 14 to 21 how the Holy Spirit had been promised and that this was prophesied about in the Old Testament, he then turns and says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works. And we remember those works, raising the dead, healing the lepers, giving sight to the blind, opening the mouths of those who were mute, walking on water, feeding 5,000. Jesus was amazing. And those miracles testified to us and to those who had eyes to see that he was the son of the living God. And God did these works in our midst. And this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The crucifixion wasn't an accident. It wasn't the triumph of Roman soldiers over the poor Nazarene. It was God's plan to save and redeem a sinful mankind. Jesus died on the cross for our sins because it was his plan his plan to save us and redeem us his plan to bring us back into fellowship with the father no one takes my life from me says Jesus but I let down on my own accord 
And this morning, if you've never thought about that before, the cross is God's way of saying to you, I love you. I have paid for your sins. And if you turn and trust that my son, Jesus, give his life that you might be saved. If you do that this morning and trust him in faith and repent from trying to earn your own way back to God or repent from turning your back on God, he will forgive you. I was part of his plan. God doesn't desire that any should perish, but all should come to know him. And that's the best thing we could do, is to know God. And so Peter preaches this. He then goes on to say, you crucified him. It's pretty straight. God raised him up. Jesus was resurrected, loosing the pangs of death. For it was, I love this, it was not possible for him to be held. Charles Wesley captures it in that beautiful hymn, him. Death in vain forbids him rise. Christ has opened paradise. And so he turns, he says, you need to do something with this Jesus. So the Spirit comes to help the church breathe, speak, live, show Jesus to the world. Later on in Acts, the description of Christian. I mean, the term Christian is actually a term of abuse. It means little Christ's. And that's what we're called to be. We're called to be little Christ by the Holy Spirit to show people what Jesus is like. One of our congregation frequently says, and it's so true, we may be the only Bible that people will read. And we're called and we need the Holy Spirit to do that through us. He comes to show us Christ and let Christ's life be seen in us. Secondly, he comes to build the church and work in that unity. Verses 42 and following. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. So he comes to preach about Christ, and he comes to link believers together. When you read 1 Corinthians, that beautiful chapter 13, the way of the Spirit is the way of love. And it's the Spirit who keeps the bond of unity of peace. It's the Spirit who keeps the fellowships together. When he is flowing amongst us, patience, kindness, goodness, love, gentleness should dominate. Not huffiness. Not grumpiness because so-and-so heard about this before so-and-so or so-and-so so and get a phone call. Or none of that. But genuine love. Seeking to count others as more significant than ourselves. Humility takes the spirit to build the church and the spirit in each one of us to keep that unity and that power verse 44 all who believed were together and had all things in common instantly that's why we struggle during this season because that's what we're designed to be this meditation the internet it's a wonderful tool for a temporary patch but it can never ever ever substitute for believers being together in one place with the Holy Spirit. And we pray for that day to come back. All things together, they sell their possessions, belongings, distributing to any who has need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad, a generous heart, praising God and finding favour with all the people. The Spirit comes first to introduce us to Jesus and to make us like him by shaping and molding our character. Secondly, he comes to build the church. He brings unity, he brings life, he brings fellowship together around Jesus. And lastly, three, he comes to seek and save. Jesus described the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us in that wonderful discourse in John, John 13 through to 17, that meal in the upper room. He says the Spirit will come to glorify me which we've talked about and he will come to convict the world of sin and unrighteousness and part of that spirit's work is to knock on the hearts of people who have turned their back on God who want nothing to do with God and show them powerfully that Jesus loves them and desires that they would repent and come and fellowship with him He is at work now throughout this corona crisis as we see people in large numbers turn to look for something more definite 
the next week's schedule or salaries or they're looking for something to put their feet in solid ground and that's part of the Holy Spirit's work he comes to peel back the layers he comes to bring us to your senses remember that prodigal of the lost son goes off into a far country the son asks his father for the inheritance he takes the inheritance flees to a far country and blows it all throws all the money out the window his friends desert him and he ends up serving pigs and I literally talk about serving pigs and he's so hungry that he ends up eating the pigs' foods and the Bible's what it says, and then he came to himself. He assessed the situation in the light of God and he returns. In this corona situation, and whatever difficulties we go through in life sometimes, it could be God's way of saying, hang on. Let's assess the situation from my sight. Come back to me. Know that I am God. That's part of the Holy Spirit's work too. So the three reasons he come, to glorify Christ, to build the church, to seek and save the lost. And he uses us for that. That's part of our faithful witnessing, is to share the hope that is within us, lived out in the unity of a church. And that has a great tug on people's hearts. So the Holy Spirit, instead of being a distant uncle, is the third person of the Godhead whom we should love and cherish and ask for his work to be more at work amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen. Greater than the dark with you, we 
Find 